And it is important to note the Charleston County coroner has not officially ruled the cause of death. I got nightmares in my head. I fear thoughts build up until I can't feel. My mind fills up into a creature. And it haunts me somewhere much deeper. I got nightmares in my head. I fear thoughts build up until I can't hear. That my mind fills up into a creature. And it haunts me somewhere much deeper. Hello and a warm welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. While the Boeing criminal probe is widening, did you know that the investigation into John Bonnet's death is ongoing, but sources have previously told the New York Post that police actually dusted his vehicle for fingerprints both inside and outside. That's a highly unusual move in these sorts of cases. Also, a Seattle grand jury has issued a subpoena over the January 5th blowout, that panel that blew out off that Alaska Airlines aircraft. In case it's not already abundantly clear, Boeing is facing a criminal investigation, similar in theme to what happened in the Rust saga. This is about safety, and although no one died on the Alaska Airlines flight, the issue is whether negligence was egregious enough to amount to criminal culpability. Bear in mind, if there are safety issues and these issues aren't resolved, you as a passenger may end up paying the price for it. Now, according to Bloomberg, quote, prosecutors appear to be interested in any correspondence and records between Boeing and a number of MAX 9 operators aside from Alaska Airlines. And that is according to a person familiar with the matter. A Boeing plane operated by the Seattle-based carrier suffered, as we know, a perilously close call in January after a fuselage panel blew out minutes after takeoff. Well, had it blown off any later, any higher, you could well have had casualties. According to Bloomberg, quote, the Justice Department is taking an aggressive approach with its criminal investigation into the mid-air blowout. Along with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Seattle, the department's fraud section in Washington is probing the incident. And all of that really is context, background essentially, to what may be related to John Barnett. Now, again, ironically, at the same time, there seems to be another serious scenario that's being investigated, the suspicious death of Boeing whistleblower John Barnett. It's too soon to say whether this will become a criminal investigation as well, but Boeing shares are being hammered right now. Currently, Boeing is selling for 179.66, down 1.4%. A recent article in Fortune provides additional insight into the final movements of Barnett before his death last Saturday morning, and that is what we're going to deal with in this analysis. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. I will be covering that final trial day, trial day 10, in the the trial of the Rust Armourer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. There's some important details we haven't finalized on this channel. And so we want to look at her mother's reaction. Thal Reed was also in court. We also want to look at the last defense witness who really... I think torpedoed the whole case, Uh, we will look at that, and then also look at the verdict itself, how Hannah responds to that, and what are the implications, if any, for Alec Baldwin. If you're enjoying this analysis, please like, share, leave a comment, you can also hit the thanks button, and let's get started. Now, a recent article in Fortune provides the following insight, the following narrative, about Barnett's final movements really is interesting, especially in terms of the timeline. On Saturday, this is according to that article, Saturday, March 9, dawned as a gusty gray morning in Charleston, South Carolina, with thunderstorms rolling across the historic city and daggers of lightning lighting up the skies. Just after 10 a.m., Rob Turkowitz was sitting in a Tony lawyer's office downtown waiting for his client John Barnett to testify 
and further his crusade for safety in the skies. My co-counsel Brian Knowles and I were gathered around a conference table alongside Boeing's in-house counsel and its trial lawyer from Ogletree, Deacons. It was in Ogletree's offices much fancier than ours, what you'd call a grand door. Turkowitz wasn't totally su- surprised that Barnett was late for this round of depositions. Because why? Well, downtown Charleston was flooded by one of the worst rainstorms I've ever seen, he said. I'd called John's room at the Holiday Inn where he was staying at 9 a.m., that's 9 a.m. Saturday, and he wanted to see if John wanted to be picked up. But according to Turkowitz, John didn't answer. Now, from this narrative, we can make at least two useful inferences. Firstly, Barnett was already not answering his phone at 9 a.m. And so that begs the question, was he in trouble then? You know, was he under duress? Was he under the influence of some other individual? Uh, or was he perhaps deceased at this point already? And I, I, I do think that it may suggest that he was already in some distress by that time. Take a moment uh, remember, the popping the sound was heard just 24 minutes later. And if you think about it, from 9 a.m. when he doesn't answer his phone to the popping sound 24 minutes later, well, uh, how long would it take to get him to his vehicle to write that note, right, as well? Secondly, it does appear that the deposition was scheduled for 10 a.m., which all seems to indicate Barnett wanted to be deposed. You know, why would he get up at the same time to inflict something on himself as he, as, he, as he would to attend this deposition? The storms and lightning may have also made visibility across the parking lot, in other words, outside, somewhat problematic, and thunder may have camouflaged the sound of a gun going off. According to Fortune, quote, Turkowitz was especially buzzed about this session because Barnett was slated to continue the account of the production gaffes, that's Boeing's production gaffes, that he'd allegedly witnessed up close on the Boeing factory floor. That would have been a dramatic narrative um, that he, you know, he would have continued with that dramatic narrative when that it started the previous day. Now, this is valuable context which may show why Boeing may not have been enthusiastic about Barnett putting a part two of testimony on the record in terms of that particular subject matter. And it may also be why Barnett died when he died. Of course, if Boeing could ill afford negative publicity around Barnett, even less so after the highly publicized door plug incident, and of course that is now a, a, a criminal trial, And so we can see now that a grand jury has decided that Boeing has a case to answer for. And if anything, Barnett is kind of a fly in the ointment. It's really complicating everything, possibly for Boeing. According to Fortune, quote, Barnett's charges had drawn fresh attention in the wake of the January 737 MAX door plug blowout on Alaska Airlines Flight 1282, just after takeoff from Portland, Oregon, following, fo- followed by a string of other mishaps on Boeing aircraft. In interviews after the Big Bang over Portland, Barnett had been scathing in his criticism of Boeing safety lapses, and according to the article, he attributed the catastrophe to the types of sloppy practices he said that he'd witnessed and flagged years earlier at the North Charleston plant. Now, the question is whether, by the way, Barnett didn't work on the 737 MAX, he worked on the 787. Nevertheless, it seems like the sloppiness might be um, almost a kind of institutionalized thing, if he is to be believed anyway. The question now is whether sloppy practices in service to profit expanded to criminal motives or even murder because silencing Barnett would also protect, theoretically, a financial bottom line. Of course, it could also seriously imperil it if it was found out. According to Fortune, we get some very interesting 
uh, information around what Barnett's final movements were and moments were before his death. That Friday, Barnett's testimony ended at around 5 p.m. according to Fortune, and the parties reconvened an hour later. Turkowitz said that John was really tired and he didn't want to testify any more that day. In fact, he wanted to drive home to Louisiana for that weekend, starting that evening as he had planned. He told his mom that he'd be home on Sunday you know, and it would take him two, di- two days to drive home, Saturday and Sunday. Turkowitz suggested that they break for a week or two, but the Boeing lawyers pushed back, saying they took the position that no more depositions could be taken until, until Barnett completed his testimony. And this seems to suggest that it was Boeing's idea that Barnett remain in town until Saturday, the Saturday of his death. I find that quite interesting, that they wanted to kind of keep him, keep him there, didn't they? There's also a third critical insight in the narrative surrounding the Holiday Inn. Guess what? Barnett hadn't checked out. So going back to what Turkowitz says, he said that uh, after, shortly after 10 a.m., he called the Holiday Inn and he said, I asked if, if Barnett had checked out and they said no, the hotel staff. I asked to be put through to the room and the phone just kept ringing. So I then asked that they check the room. The Holiday Inn folks said that his stuff's packed up, but he's not there. That's a very important point, that his stuff was packed, but he's not there. Now, why would you pack your stuff only to take your own life? Doesn't make sense, does it? The manager came back and told me his truck is still there and we called EMS. I can't tell you any more than that. At that point, the lawyers around the conference table feared that Barnett could have suffered a heart attack. Well, the fact that his pact again shows the intent to leave and to travel and shows a sort of a consciousness of, of what he intends to be doing over the next few days, it doesn't match this idea of a self-inflicted wound. And so the fact that he's not checked out shows something interfered with his plans right then as he was making ready to leave his hotel. Something or someone interfered. Barnett also described his experience at the North Charleston and Everett plant, that there were major safety issues that he uncovered, and he also said that there seemed to be a a motto in Charleston of, we can do anything we want. It seems the Boeing bigwigs may be suffering from the same mania that afflicted Alex Murdoch. You're untouchable until you aren't. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.